Today I've been asked to, to envision a better tomorrow for elephants at a time when their future prospects are, well, really couldn't, could hardly be grimmer. Um, the ivory trade is raging out of control. Habitat losses in free fall and human, human elephant conflict continues unabated. And with trade in wildlife products valued at something be between 10 and $20 billion a year, um, elephants are just one of the better known casualties. So are there any rays of hope? Well, I think so. As examples, in the northern rangelands of Kenya, in the Maasai Mara, and in Amboseli, just in the last couple of months, there have been signs that poaching is abating. And what each of these positive stories has at their core are people working together with a heartfelt connection for the animals that they're protecting. So only time will tell whether this fragile trend is going to hold. And with Chinese demand for ivory soaring, we really are up against formidable odds. I've studied elephants and worked for their conservation and welfare for close to four decades. And so much has changed during that time. In the early days, in the, in the mid-1970s in Amboseli, we pioneered monitoring the life histories of elephants in the old-fashioned way, using uh, a few of us out following the elephants with ID cards and pen and, and, and paper. And over the years, through films, through books, we popularized the life stories of elephants. Um, the likes of Echo here became household names. And elephants were no longer merely objects, but they were characters with whom we could relate. Our research assistants, Nora, Soila, Katito, were women from the local community. And today, they are internationally recognized elephant champions. And average Kenyans now are actively engaged in elephant conservation. They're um, protesting the destruction of elephants, writing uh, scientific papers, working in the field, um, and voicing their concerns on Facebook. And people around the world seem to yearn for a connection with these incredible giants. Asking to volunteer, naming elephants, adopting orphans. And as the popular interest in elephants has grown, Petter, my husband and Elephant Voices colleague, and I began to think, well, what if we could involve people in the kind of work that we do? What if we were able to share our observations with the public? What if tourists and local people alike were able to contribute the observations that they had made? And what if by doing so, we were able to create a community of people who cared as much about the future of elephants as we do? What if elephants, their families, their clans, and their habitats could be nurtured and protected by individual people, their families, entire communities? What if we could build a global network of, of people working to, together? It would be compassionate conservation at work. <laughs> They're so cute. <laughs> We sat here with these elephants for about two hours, and I swear this, this young female here was just um, showing off for us. I mean, she, she came up and played with the car for a while, and then she just engaged with these two little, two little calves for about two hours. So our, last year, our little organization, Elephant Voices, set out to try and use citizen science and web technology to forge those connections, starting elephant partners in the Maasai Mara. Our concept is to use cell phone-based uh, upload of data and online sharing of observations to connect people to the lives of individual elephants. 
and our vision is to inspire a global network of people working together to ensure a future for the Mara elephants and to inform conservation management. So working with Kenyan programmers, um, we designed and built what we've called the Mara Elephant Who's Who and Whereabouts databases. The Who's Who is a unique registry of individual elephants that is searchable by physiognomic characteristics. And it's linked by individuals to what we call the Whereabouts database that houses all of the uh, sightings of elephant groups. And both the who's who and the whereabouts are connected to Google-based mapping function. So to allow uh, many different people to contribute to the whereabouts database, we designed and built a cell phone application, um, which includes sightings, wounded elephants, and mortalities, and permits direct upload to the database. And the Mara Eli app, as it's called, is freely downloadable from the Android market. And we have built into it a name an elephant program. And of course, the Mara elephants are on Facebook. So how does it all work? Well, let me give you an illustration using uh, Kirsten Boucher. She's a nurse. She lives in Germany. And she is one of our many participants. She's a great photographer. She loves elephants, and she saves up um, to come to the Mara as often as she can. And she's used the database to get to know the individual elephants that she has seen in the Mara. And, she, and her observations are helping us to build an understanding of the Mara elephants. So how much, considering that there are thousands of elephants in the Mara and over 700 registered in the database so far, how might she be able to um, identify this larger elephant? Well, she might notice that this elephant has a smooth ear with tiny nicks. Um, she has an, uh, an upcurved tusk that's higher on the right-hand side. She's a large adult female. And if you look here, her ear bulges forward. So then she could go to the, to the database. She's selected female, large adult, on the tusks higher right, on the right ear smooth with tiny nicks, and the ear shape lobes bulge. And by pushing the search button, 700 elephants is reduced to two individuals. By hovering over the code numbers there, a little thumbnails appear, and she can see that F female number 115 matches the elephant she's looking for. So, so then, um, as a non-resident uh, non of the Mara, Kirsten can contribute $500 to name this elephant. And she's done so. She named her Sion. You can see it says up there, named by Kirsten Boucher. And her name then appears on the ID card and on any photographs that she's contributed toward the database. So her, her observations and her naming of elephants and her financial con contributions allow Kirsten to feel that she is integrated in the project and that even though she lives in Germany, she can make a difference. Well, each of the observations that Kirsten has made is then uploaded to the database. So here is an observation she's made of Sian's family. And after having named um, Sian, she then decided she wanted to name the whole family. So she named a second adult female in the family. Well, her donations are going to go toward um, an elephant scholarship, the tuition for putting a student through uh, a course at the Koyaki Guiding School in the Mara. And Derek Nabala is one of the hundreds of Maasai guides who has graduated from the Koyaki Guiding School. And Derek is another partner of, uh, uh, sorry, another participant of Elephant Partners. And we spent a day out watching elephants together. And after that, Derek went back, got on Facebook. Yes, you can get on Facebook in the Mara. And he wrote, elephants are awesome when identifying. It gives more sense of care. And Derek just got it. He had connected with some elephants.
one of the elephants that he connected with um, was F, or female, number 96. And um, she has this beautiful upcurved right tusk and a hole in her left ear. And Derek then decided to name her goodness because that's what he thought of her character. Well, through citizen science and the many photographs that, we, uh, that have been sent to us, we've been able to gather unusual pieces of information. For instance, we know that this apparently uh, peaceful female, uh, female number 30303, or Tilly, as she's called, covers quite a large range, and at least one of her family members is a killer of cows. If you go to the mapping page and you put in her number there and filter, you can see where she's been seen. And you can see that she's been seen six, uh, six times. The numbers in there show um, two, two observations in that particular area. One, one of the observations was by a researcher, another by a conservancy manager. Two observations were by two different tourists, and two were made by, by me. Um, one of these was on Olaria Rock Conservancy, and where she was seen by the manager, Rob O'Meara, leaving the scene of a crime. M73, male number 73, has also been seen across the northern conservancies, and he's been observed seven times so far. He's a real ham. He's been named Stony by Pat Derby, who runs, uh, is the founder and director of the, the, um, the Performing Animal Welfare Society in California. She runs an elephant sanctuary there. And she named him Stony uh, in memory of an Asian elephant who was injured while performing in Las Vegas. Um, unable to walk, Stony was put into a dumpster and wheeled out to the back of the hotel and um, then put in a mechanical cattle crush and left in a dark room. And it wasn't until a year later that an attempt was made to release Stoney from the mechanical device, uh, whereupon he fell, injuring the other, uh, the other leg, and he had to be euthanized later that day. Well, Pat Derby was very involved in this case, and she wanted to know that his namesake would live on um, wild and free. Well, querying the data database, the mapping function, sorry, reveals a basic trends in, um, in habitat use that can be useful for elephant conservation. For instance, here you can see that I have, um, I have asked the database to show me where family groups have been seen or family groups with an adult male. And you can see that uh, the observations are across uh, the Masai Mara National Reserve as well as outside to the north in these northern conservancies. But if you, if you search then on male groups only, you very quickly see that male groups preferentially use the bushland areas to the north and the east of the park. And on the eastern park, 19-year-old Ginny Cowell lives with her family and works with a team of, um, of Maasai scouts to protect elephants and predators there. And I'm in touch with her via Facebook, via Skype, um, and on email several times a week. So the data that she and the scouts have collected um, show that that Siana is very important. There are very large groups of elephants and very large males, but it's also an area that's been neglected. And as a result, it has suffered very high levels of poaching. So we already know uh, in the short time that Elephant Partners has been, been working that this is a very important area um, for us to focus on. Well, um, our databases have been online since October last year. We have over 700 elephants registered. Uh, over 750 sightings uh, have been uploaded to the whereabouts database, and over 70 different people have participated. And we now have a, a Kenyan master's student working with us. Elephant Partners is an ambitious project working in a cross-border uh, ecosystem on a population of several thousand elephants. 
and many challenges lie ahead, but the early results, I think, are promising. And in areas, I think, where there's good internet connectivity and, and species for which recognizing individuals is possible, I think the method we've pioneered uh, provides a way to engage people in the conservation of biodiversity. Thank you.